Hi, welcome back. I am Amy Dean. I'm with Save the Wild Chinchillas. We're a group of people. We are not an organization. We're not a company. We used to be, but we're not anymore. We work under another, under other non-governmental organizations for our funding. Um, this is our wildlife series. And today there's lots of definitions and talking about ecosystems and biomes and habitats. So let's get started. We're being funded by ZGAP and Tulsa Zoo for this video series. So let's start off with an ecosystem. Now, an ecosystem is all the living and non-living parts of an area. Um, so we have a biotic community. That's all species that occur in a common area and interact with each other directly or indirectly. For example, the chinchillas, the abracombinetes, the degus, the octodon degus. These are all little small rodents that live in the same area. They occupy the same community. Energy flows from the sun to the plants to the animals. And there's always a loss of energy as it flows through the system. So um, the primary producers, the plants, lose energy or the energy is lost when those, when the energy comes in from the sun to those plants. And then it gets lost as it goes up the pyramid, that the food chain. The biomass pyramid. Now you always need a lot of underlying species to support a higher level of species. So if you have a pyramid and on the bottom you have grass, you have lots and lots of grass. And then the pyramid gets skinnier and you have some grazers or browsers. And then it gets even skinnier when you have the predators that eat those grazers and browsers. So you always need a lot more on the bottom to support what levels of feeding are higher up. Biogeographical realms are organized organizations of how we've split up the earth so that we can talk about different places on earth. So you'll have the old north or the old Arctic and the new Arctic and the Ethiopian area, the oriental, the ocean area, Australia, Antarctica, neotropical. Neotropical being the new tropics, which would be South America, Central America. Biotic prov provinces or realms further subdivided into provinces different from other native species, native flora and fauna. So we're going to look at a couple maps and just so that you have um, in your mind what this looks like, you don't need to remember this for anything. Oh, well, we're going to go to that next, I guess. Um, here, we'll go back to the last slide. So the old Arctic, the new Arctic, the new tropics, the Afrotropics, Indomalayas, Aust Australia, Australia, Sia, Australia, that area, New Zealand, Australia, there's Papua New Guinea. Antarctica and the ocean. And these are all different, huge, large biomes. Um, biomes with similar climatic characteristics support similar flora and fauna. For example, you'll have tropical plants in the tropics. They have a similar temperature. They're at the, uh, the same level across the earth around the equator to 23 north and south around in that area. Um, so they have lots of input from the sun year round, lots of rain in many of those areas. So there's different types. These are based on their place on the earth, plus the precipitation and the, the temperature. And that in turn tells you the growing cycle for the vegetation. Um, so the tundra, oh, well, we have these different ones listed here. We'll go with the tundra. That's um, where there's permafrost underneath the topsoil. Um, so it's always frozen there. It's treeless, it's cold. It, the winter's eight months long. Uh, then you'll have forests, which are places with trees, deserts, dry areas, grasslands, places with lots of grass, savannas are included in that. The taiga is the northern con coniferous forest. Uh, all right, so let's go into coniferous and evergreen and deciduous. Coniferous is cone-bearing trees, like pine trees. Evergreen are trees that do not lose their leaves year-round. They lose them gradually here and there, and they're replaced by new ones. Deciduous, they lose their leaves in the fall. That's when the resources are the scarcest, the dry season, and then they'll gain them again um, in the spring. The tro tropics and subtropical humid forests, these are wet areas. Um, they have lots of humidity, southern Florida down to Venezuela, that area, if you're in the west, uh, western hemisphere. And then you'll have deciduous forest and woodlands that are tropical and subtropical. These are going to lose their leaves. The Mediterranean climates. Now these are um, in a specific areas on earth based on when their precipitation hit occurs. And these all have wet winter seasons. So that's where we're at in Chile with the chinchillas. It's a wet winter season. We get our, it's the coldest part of the year when we get our, our precip precipitation. Um, South Africa has a little bit of some 
Australia has some some um, biomes of this, some areas of this in Australia, and then around the Mediterranean, that's how it caught, got its name. And then there's, all right, so now we've gone through the different types of biomes, and then we have faunal regions, and there's strong differences in areas with well-defined boundaries, and um, at different boundaries, you'll have a gradual change in these species. It won't be instant all the time. Sometimes it is a well-defined, sometimes it's not. Um, similar species occur in like, in like faunal regions. Um, for example, and this is based on the, the species physiology, in different locations we'll have primates in Africa and in South America. And these primates are different. Uh, the ones in South America have prehensile tails, some, uh, but in Africa they don't. Um, but there, the camels, you'll have camels. There's two kinds of cameras. Some are further in, oh, further in the Orient. And then the other ones are over in um, Northern Africa, the, the Middle East. Uh, cats, you'll have, we have jaguar, puma, whatever you're going to call it, in Chile, where the chinchillas are, whereas you'll have tigers in, in India. So we've gone over this, the different areas. So here we are in this Mediterranean climate in Chile. You'll see it around the Mediterranean. These are those wet winters. Oh, Southern California has it also. I forgot about that. Um, Australia and South Africa. And then the tropics are around the tropics, around the equator, around in this area. The subtropics will go further north and south. So there's types of species based on trophic niches. And a trophic niche is really where a species fits into its its um, community, its biological community. And these are most often based upon, I mean, the, you can have trophic niches. These are based on feeding. There's other kinds of niches that are based on behavior or I don't remember the other ones now, right off the top of my head. All right. Carnivores, generalist, um, are not, not carnivores, herbivores. We're starting over here on the left side. Herbivores, they're generalists, the seed eaters. Um, it's less harmful to a system and they will starve without seed production. So many years of not having a rain and then the seeds being produced from the flowers, from those plants being able to have flowers because of the rain and growth will lead to um, starvation. And that's what you'll see with a lot of these J, J um, eruptive populations, J curve eruptive populations like the Phyllota starweenie. You'll have leaf eaters. Um, grazers, and they can destroy a, a system rapidly. Um, and browsers, grazers eat leaves, browsers eat woody parts, and these can also just kill a plant if they eat too much of that plant. Grazers and browsers, um, large densities can, can destroy plants and, and systems, and that's what we have with a huge um, population of goats in the chinchilla system. Just going through an they're not native to the area. They, they um, are in a higher population than the native grazers would be, and they just decimate the vegetation. Um, a cecum is a stomach chamber, and I'm not sure why I have this in here, but it helps break down plant material. So you'll have foregut and hindguts um, uh, fermentation, and these are just ad adaptations to break down food from the different animals. Frugivores are fruit eaters and they disperse seeds. They'll eat the fruit and then maybe they'll is, is, and consume the seed and it'll be excreted out as well, or they'll just eat the fruit and toss off the seed. Omnivores are generalist scavengers. Um, they switch prey. So sometimes maybe they're eating fruits, sometimes they're eating animals, sometimes they're eating something else, uh, fish. Carnivores are specialists. Um, it's easy to digest animals that have, that have everything that you need. The quantity of spray species limits the food supplies. So in Alco, we have foxes and they're carnivores and they eat. Normally, you you'd think of a fox as eating meat, eating the frogs or the lizards or some animal, but they also eat large amounts of fruit, which I did not realize. And then you have apex predators. And these are the predators that seldom get killed by another animal. Um, the pumas, the orcas, the Great sharks, great white sharks. These are apex predators. The cats are, are apex carnivores. They only eat meat. And then we have the decomposers. These are the fungi and the bacteria that decompose all the old material that's dead. And they turn it 
or that is dying and they turn it into new soil for a new cycle of soil, vegetation, plant life, animal life. Um, this is what the wild chinchillas eat based on studying their feces um, by Connie Mullis in 1983. This is where this came from. I'm not sure who actually did the study on it, but these are the plants that we focus on rehabilitating because are revegetating, rewilding, making the area wild again, enhancing habitat, fixing the ecosystem as much as we possibly can. So um, Rumpiato, they eat the seeds, Carbonio, they eat the seeds, and that by eating those seeds, that's what they're eating during the dry season when there's not enough rain. Um, Ranilla, the leaf, stem, leaf, leaf. So these are things that they like to eat the leaves of. Um, and remember, we have these, lots of these are evergreen. They're not going to go dry during the um, wet season. They're evergreen, even though they're in a Mediterranean system. They're not, they're not evergreens as in trees. They're evergreen plants that never drop their leaves or drop them, but in, not all at once, every once in a while here and there it's always adding more and it actually adds more in the spring but okay and then what they actually really like a lot are this right here this is a grass species they like this one a lot um so that's what we try and spread a lot of around and then when it rains that'll germinate hopefully we have it by season this is when they consume the consume it so they're eating dry grass and and fresh green grass when it's available same with pingo pingo um i think they actually like their fruit from this too but i'm not sure if you want specifics on which plants th these are and what they look like you can look at our inventory our cuyano inventory which is a biological inventory it's a list of the species all the species that someone encountered during a time period and all the plants that they encountered in that area and we'll need to add to that because that was survey was taken over a six month period that did not include um, immediately after the spring season, right after our winter rainfall. Species need a place to live, and that means habitat. And it's a space environment suited to a particular species. This is what they need. They have to have it. Um, habitat can support a certain number of species, and that's its carrying capacity. It, above that number, or when you approach that number, animals are going to start to get stressed and there's not going to be enough resources for the animals to survive. So habitat is space with the species require resources. And then the niche is the function of the species in that community, in that area. Um, a geographical range is a map location of species and is determined by the species adaptation to where it can live. The climate, the vegetation, the topography. By topography, so the short, the long-tailed chinchillas cannot live above, we'll say, three thousand meters or so. I'm not sure how. I, well, that's we've not we've not found the short tail or the long tails at three thousand meters. So we'll say three thousand meters. Um, but it, it's their adaptation to that climate, to that vegetation, the climate. They're living in that desert area semi-desert mediterranean climate it's hot they have longer tails they've adapted longer tail they've evolved to have longer tails and bigger ears to to have an increased ability to disperse heat so they can live in that area whereas the short tail chinchillas have those shorter tails and the shorter ears they're going to be higher up and they can conserve more heat so with topo topography we're talking not, not just talking about north and south from the equator we're talking about lower and higher up a mountain as also a barrier um, the geographical range is a map of the location where the species exist now here's an idea of where we should be able to find short-tailed chinchillas up high this is higher in the andes this is the pacific ocean this is chile this is argentina bolivia uh peru up there and this is the short-tailed chinchilla and there's some spots over here where we actually know it's living right along the coast um, but this is the ideal place according to this this formula this module this computer program that that models where we might be able to find them so that's can just give you an idea of its range its range is the, for the short for the long-tailed chinchilla its range is going to be about from here up to about here and then for that short-tailed it's going to be up through here but it does, remember, it doesn't exist in all of those areas. So um, this trapping grid we'll talk about in another lecture that's already been recorded. So maybe you've already seen it. But this is what the habitat actually looks like where the short or where the long-tailed chinchillas are. There's cacti. People don't realize that. It's um, 
not 100% ground cover. They hop. That's useful if it had all these vines and undergrowth. They wouldn't be able to hop through their habitat. So a habitat is a space that has all the required resources for that species. So it's going to have cover. And cover is, um, it changes in its quantity and quality over time because of the annual cycle of plants and leaves and grass. Um, its distribution in relation to other and other resources is important. So you have your shelter, but it, maybe your shelter, you need your, your shelter within an area where you're going to be able to get the resources that you need, the food you need. Um, it, shelter or cover also provides refuge and escape from predators. And this plant that chinchillas use, this puya plant, is great for escaping larger animals because these leaves have uh, I'm going to say, all right, they're thorns um, on the edges, on both edges, and they're retract, they're uh, not retracted. They look like cat, retractable cat claws, what a cat claws look like all up and down those. Um, and so it's easy to put your arm in, but to come out, you're going to be sh just shredded um, with, with scratches all down your arm. So that, that's a good place for their, their refuge, their, their protection, their shelter. Roosting is a place to rest, to avoid predation, and the nesting is where you actually have the offspring and they, they are until, they're there until they can move from there, until they're old enough. Um, plant cycles. In spring, you have high nutritional value, value early in the growing season. The protein reaches a maximum, and in the fall and winter, usually the protein reaches a minimum after seed production and the plant dries. Um Climate variations and plant cycles. So predictable, stable climates are the tropics. Year-round wet, there's going to be food. Non-predictable food sources are deserts, like where we're at, because it's dry usually, um, but we have a normal amount of rainfall, we'll say. And then we'll have years where, and long extended droughts, where we are way below that rainfall. Um, and then El Nino will occur also, and that'll give us a, usually give us a lot of precipitation, and we'll see populations grow after that. Um, disturbances can be natural, fast, um, and it depends on the rate of these. And so, a forest fire, uh, clearing for mining where the holes are. Um, it, there's a positive relation between soil for, for fertility and food. And then and turn wildlife because if your soil if you have a good quality soil, um, then plants can grow and you'll have more you'll have food or higher resources um, than if you had low so soil fertility. And then in turn, if the wildlife's growing in an area with good soil fertility, you'll have healthy um, wildlife. They'll have what they need to survive and reproduce. And hopefully, if it's endangered or uh, produce more offspring. So this is what it looks like during El Nino in our study area, the upper left picture. It's really green. That was in 1997. Um, I want to say about August. I don't know. I was there the entire season. And there was actually snow that reached this area, which snow doesn't usually reach this far down on the top of the mountains in the background. So this is one area. And I want to point out, this tr this line here this line here goats no goats this is what i mean by decimating the vegetation in the area goats have been down here um this is an area where we're restoring some of these grasses the chinchillas like and they've started to grow and it's green up here this is what it looks like during the dry season during a let me think mm, yeah it wasn't that much of a drought at this time and this is what it looks like in the spring after the, the after we've had some winter rainfall and we have the flowers. Um, these are plants that chinchillas like to eat. These are carbonillos. Um, they like to eat the seeds from these during their during the when there's time that they don't have grasses. Water is another part of habitat. It's, like, it's the quality and the quantity. So the distribution in relation to the other resources. It's the same with cover that always make habitat for an animal. Um, the availability of the water and its interconnections, the species habitat in a biome uh, is is the, it has doesn't need free water to drink like octodon de goods. They we believe they need free water to drink. Um, maybe they don't. I'm not sure on that one. But anyways, um, the availability to the water 
And then also, where's that water at when with dispersal and the distribution of the spacing of the territory? Um, do they have water year round or must they migrate? And we'll talk about migrating from, um, especially in Africa, you'll see the great herds migrating to the next water water of the grazers and the browsers migrating from one water hole to the next and you'll get large herds. So adaptation to reduced water loss, um, leaf type succulents and deciduous. So those are uh, adaptations to a plant. To uh, Succulents have thicker leaves on the outside, the, the outer layer of the leaf, and so they can hold the water in. And then that way they can get through the drier periods of time by that stored water they have. Deciduous plants will lose their leaves to, and that's an adaptation to having a reduced environment or water in the environment. Nocturnal activities um, help to reduce water loss. Kidney functions concentrating urine. Desert species concentrate their urine um, so that they lose less water by from urine, urine from going to the bathroom. Um, food sources. You obtain your water from your prey species. So if you're eating a fruit, like the cactus fruit that chinchillas like to eat, um, that has a lot of water content in it. Um, and then if you're a cat species and you're eating a rabbit or a hare or whatever small animal, a chinchilla, um, you're going to get your waters from that species also it, in some form from its body. We're not going to talk about the oceans, except to say that, you know, once the, all the land masses were in this huge continent called Pangaea, and then they split apart. And that splitting apart did affect, like, we have marsupials in Chile, which you normally associate with Australia. And they also, in North America, you'll have opossums. And we have mouse opossums in this area where the chinchillas are. That's the Thylotus that's now called Mimosa or something like that, I think, for its genus. I don't remember. Um, so what limits a species range? Climate. Is it too hot or too cold for that animal to exist there? Mountains. Is it too high in the mountains? Is it too cold in the mountains? Because as you go up in the mountains, it gets colder. Uh, deserts often limit a species distribution. So maybe you'll have something that lives in north or south or east or west of a desert and it doesn't live in the desert and then you'll see some of it maybe or maybe not on the other side of it. But maybe, maybe it's a different species or species specific, but maybe in the same genus. Um, oceans restrict a species from getting from one place to another. Um, resource distributions, where's their where's their cover, their food, and their water? Um, and has it been disturbed? Um, disturbances, clearing a forest, clearing of desert, native desert habitat can affect where a species lives its range. And then uh, species ranges can also be um, limited by predators or competitors. So it turns out that there's this one, th in, out of all the different parts of habitat, there could be a single factor in shortest supply relative to demand that is the critical determinant of the species distribution. So there's this one thing that the animal must have, and if it doesn't have enough, then that's going to affect its distribution. So and so each environmental factor has both minimum and maximum level. So maybe... Um, an animal can exist at this temperature at its minimum and this at its maximum, and that's its tolerance limits. It can, it can, but outside of those limits, it cannot survive. For example, no humans can live permanently above five kilometers, and that's due to oxygen. So here's what it would look like. Um, so any, take any uh, one of the uh, of the required resources an animal needs: food, the water, the temperature. And you, you will have the most of them in this optimal range. And then you'll have the zone of stress where it's the resource is there, but it, their animals are being stressed. And then you'll have zone of intolerance where these animals cannot exist because it's above or below their, their environmental um, adaptation to whatever that factor is. And I think that's all for right now. Um, I do have a couple of notes I wanted to go over. So when we're talking in lecture one about, you know, when were we taken, when were we as humans taken away from or separating ourselves from the rest of wildlife? And I don't know when that was exactly, but I know 10,000 years ago is when we began to change to, to domestication and our agriculture. So um, lots of people look at that 10,000 year ago timeline.